Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another episode of Building Ginormous Rockets. Now, in the previous episode, we crashed Bob Kerman into the moon a little too quickly and he lost all his engines. However, thanks to Kerbal Space Program being a simulation of reality rather than reality, I happen to have a quick save sitting around and I could go back and try again and that's what I did. So yes, Bob Kerman once again attempting the same approach to the moon. Starting from over five and a half kilometers per second, it will take several minutes for him to kill off his velocity and, well, hopefully deposit the spacecraft lightly onto the surface before he begins his return to Kerbin at a similar breakneck speed. Now we're down to the last two stages. We have over 8 kilometers per second of delta V between these, we're going to use up just about two and a half slowing down. So that should leave us about five and a half, maybe six kilometers per second to return to Kerbin. But first of all, of course, we have to very carefully put this down on the surface. And you can see in my vessel, that my suicide uh, distance, suicide burn distance, has actually gone positive because I actually started breaking too early. But that's fine, it just means I have arrived above the surface and can carefully put myself down. All of this faffing around above the lunar surface is, of course, wasting time. We're certainly landing it with some care. And we are almost there. 30 meters, 20 meters. Come on, gotta, gotta touch down maybe a little carefully here because it looks like there's a bit of a hill. I can't really tell. And touchdown. Okay, we've done our research now. There we are. We're getting ready and go home. Now, heading off, we have about... Oh, we've just under four and a half kilometers per second left. So, you can't target the planet Kerbin from the map. You have to instead... In broad terms, you're going to aim at it, but you're going to add a little bit of uh, bias towards the east. The reason is you have to offset the built-in orbital velocity of the moon. Oh yeah, I forgot to ditch my landing gear. So that's wasted a whole bunch of delta V that could otherwise be useful. But otherwise, yeah, you can see me, of course, doing this at many times regular speed. Accelerating downwards towards the planet Kerbin and... Obviously, I want to get it on target as soon as possible and then just go straight and pick up as much speed as I can. We've already passed three kilometers per second and we have about another uh, one and a half left. So we're going to do OK, but we're not going to do stellar, to be honest. I, we are certainly not going to beat that magic one hour mark. Will I beat one hour and 10 minutes, one hour, 20 minutes? We're going to find out. Well, there's one hour, 10 minutes. Will I beat one hour, 20? Ah, no, we're not, but we are heading downwards and watch the G meter. The G meter is going to be simply amazing here. You can see G force in the surface uh, diagram. It has a maximal value of 133 Gs. Oh, Bob is now, I don't know, giblets or something. Actually, 130 G is surprisingly less than the highest G force documented to have been survived by a human. I believe there's documented cases of racing drivers experiencing more than 200 Gs in impacts momentarily. Okay, so I've got to deploy the parachute just at the right moment. And, okay, there we go. A little too early. And that is, of course, precious time being wasted. But one hour, 21 minutes. Can I do better? Well, of course I'm going to try and do better. I have that one hour magic target in my head that I have to beat. So I build the rocket, I make it bigger. This is over 16,000 tons at launch. 1,080 parts, many of which are struts. I mean, look at it. It struts as far as the eye can see. It's got vast tracts of struts. But it turns out that it doesn't have quite enough. Uh, as you, if you look at this, you can see that it's actually oscillating in the kind of north-south direction. And that was a pretty gnarly problem that I had to track down. It looks like a pretty small oscillation, but when you're staging, well, this first stage... Uh, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, the oscillation was enough to cause the rocket to smash against it, and everything just starts falling apart. Everything goes everywhere, things explode, everything is awesome. 
everything is awesome when you're part of an exploding rocket. And I do mean awesome in the, the sense that it's taking my breath away or something like that. Look at this. This is playing at like twice normal speed, just so you, you know, wonder why the explosions aren't sounding quite as impressive. Four times regular speed it just sounds like chaff, but two times regular speed is almost acceptable. So I fire up my rocket to get clear, and at least I'm slightly clear of the morass. Once again, stage, and finally... Finally, I do actually emerge from the detritus, emerge from the storm of destructive material or whatever, destructive tanks that could spell an end to Doffrey Kerman's career and indeed life if they collide with him. I mean, the advantage is that he gets to watch most of the other things exploding from a relatively safe distance as they crash into the ground. I was kind of hoping that it would hit one of the buildings, make things more spectacular, but nope, it was not to be. Doffrey Kerman, of course, heading towards the ground and trying to kill his velocity as quickly as possible and actually makes a really good landing. That is, of course, practice for arriving on the moon. But Kermans are never ones to be phased by explosions, so he returns with a slightly adjusted design, and, well, that doesn't work either. Once again, explosions everywhere. Explosions as far as the eye can see. So, staging is so what I start to do is stage. And then, with the careful application of rocket thrust, I shall emerge from this and perhaps survive. Oh, well, there's more things exploding. We'll need to stage those as well. There we go. Ditch those. Okay. And... Oh, wait, I should have probably throttled down before staging. This may not actually work quite so well. Get out of there! Get out of there! No! No! Ah! Oh. Oh no! Yes, uh, a lot of changing around and things exploding on the ground. Wow, I'm a poet and I didn't even know it! This is of course why most rockets make turns uh, immediately after launching so that all the debris does not land on the launch site. Anyway, I did a bit of analysis and I traced the oscillation problem down to some missing struts that had been caused by, well, symmetry being broken when I started to copy things around. So finally, I make yet another attempt. 16,000 tons and this is what it looks like in real life. Yes, this is horrific. Thankfully, of course, I have time acceleration in post-production. So you can watch it somewhat a little more, uh, a little more <laughs> palatably, let's say. Uh, good news is, of course, that rocket engines, when you accelerate, when you, you speed up rocket engines, they sound pretty much like rocket engines, whether they're ten times regular speed or, or regular speed. But anyway, yeah, we start to head upwards. Now, uh, if you look at this design compared to previous designs, I've now got uh, stacks of four and five tanks on the outer rim. Those tanks have double engines on the bottom, so the first set of tanks on the outside I have less mass because I want to have more acceleration early on. And you can see I've already passed 100 meters per second just before burnout, so we jettison those. And then of course we can, uh, well, we're going to have those the next ring in, they also have double engines on them. The double engines are placed using the cubic octagonal struts, you put those and then you attach the engines to them. So you can place two sets of the largest engines on the bottom of these. That's eight KS-25 engines. Of course, the whole thing, 16,000 tons and all, uh, that's about five times, more than five times the mass of a Saturn V rocket at launch. Of course, a Saturn V rocket wasn't attempting to go to the moon in under an hour. On the other hand, the Saturn V does actually manage higher accelerations, although at launch it starts with a thrust to weight of about 1.2. By the time the first stage burns out, it's accelerating at about 4 Gs. And there goes another stage, viewed from inside the cockpit by Doffrey Kerman. Now you'll notice that I am actually performing a gravity turn as if I'm going into orbit. And the reason is, of course, because we want to reduce gravity losses. We want to be going sideways so we can 
convert as much of the Delta V that we have into actual velocity heading towards the moon. Now, now that does mean that we're going to travel about 600 kilometers extra, but I wager that the reduction in gravity losses will actually make me get to the moon faster and hopefully get me back faster, but we're going to find out. Now, when Abyssal Lurker did his giant rocket, he, uh, it was so big, it was he was unable to steer it, right? It was just literally had to go straight up because that was the only way that would work. And I got to also point out, he was using much older parts, smaller parts. So, you know what? This should be easy for me to beat, right? But perhaps I just don't have the magic skills to build super ginormous rockets. Who knows, but we're headed towards the moon and our time to encounter is now less than 40 minutes. See me pushing it down, we're trying to get a time to encounter of under half an hour. And from there we shall cruise to the moon. We shall give our engines a rest for a moment before finally turning around and firing them up again so that we can actually slow down. So, now of course I could probably save a bit of mass if I didn't have all those re those um, reaction wheels there. The reaction wheels of course make this thing actually pretty steerable. And they were pretty essential during initial launch because the of the habit of the whole vehicle to flex and wobble and point the engines in directions other than the ones that I want them to point. But those concerns are past now as the moon begins to loom large in the... Well, I don't know, he can't see it from where he is. He's just reading his readout screens. We're starting the deceleration burn at 1,200 kilometers. Again, a lot of experimenting to find this, and the experimentation is largely dependent on the rocket. You'll also notice that I've added a very small extra stage on top of this. That ultimately added another uh, three kilometers per second or thereabouts to the whole thing, so it's quite a significant bonus. That small extra mass on the final stage didn't really affect the ultimate uh, thrust to weight ratio of the whole vehicle and it gave me a few extra kilometers per second of delta V, so that is a win. I've also carefully adjusted this whole uh, mission so that the descent to the lunar surface will take place in daylight. That way at least we will have time for our eyes to bulge out of our head as we realize we're about to slam into this lifeless body at several kilometers per second. But that is not going to happen this time because I can actually activate these engines in sequence. There we go. Moving at about two kilometers per second with 80 kilometers to go. I think we're gonna do this just right. But of course at times like this, I like to give old me the chance to deliver his unvarnished opinion of the situation. Okay, good news is we are below one kilometer per second and our altitude is still acceptable. We're now at seven kilometers up, six. Obviously, this we're landing on quite a high region here. The engines are working as hard as they can to slow me down, and the ground is coming up really, really, really fast. Now let's try and put it down a little more gently this time. We want to. We don't want to waste too much time. Time is running, and the clock is not going to be kind to me here. Ah, oh, overshot! I overshot, and I'm now floating back upwards. Oh. oh. How is it that when you want to fall, gravity seems so weak? And then when you're trying to land and put it down carefully, gravity always seems to just take you and slam you into the surface. Right now, I would really like gravity to wake up and pull me down. Come on, the clock is a ticking. The clock is ticking, thank you. Okay, we're just gonna make a little burn at the last second. There we go. Keep it below 10 meters per second, that'll get us there. Okay, ever so gently, and onto the surface. We gotta let all the things, what we need is lights for all of these. Oh crap, I slowed down too much. Look, nice touchdown, nice touchdown. Yes, oh, let it settle. Let's go, let's go. We are heading home to Kerbin. Okay, old me, stop singing, you're embarrassing yourself. Okay, ditching that, ditching that, and we're now down to our last two stages. 
doing the usual trick. One thing I, I uh, realized is if you want to head back to Kerbin really quickly, you can actually target an object on the surface of Kerbin. So I just picked a bit of debris, targeted that, and yeah, use that on the nav ball to make sure that I'm pointed directly at Kerbin. I mean, okay, we're, we're plus or minus 600 kilometers, but who's counting? As long as we hit that atmosphere going straight down. So we ditch this stage and we're on to the final stage here. It's going to make us move super, super, super fast. Uh, I did the mathematics, by the way. If you want to use reaction control, uh, your monopropellant engines, pretty much two kilometers per second or thereabouts is the cutover for the, the small lander can. That means if you need more than two kilometers per second, you're more efficient going with traditional liquid fuel and oxidizer engines. Uh, if you want less than that, then it's good to go with the massless RCS engines. So if you're wondering, that's the crossover. So uh, unfortunately, due to a slight accident, I managed to trigger the parachute, which means I it will deploy for me automatically. Uh, that means it'll waste time. I did try to get out on the way back and try to fix it, but I can't repack it unless it's actually been deployed. So I can't like tell it to undeploy itself or stop deploying itself. Watch the G-forces. G-forces are gonna be crazy crazy yes now that is absolutely fatal to a human being the max g value got set to something bizarre but i did check the frame by frame and it's about 250 g's that we de decelerate at so yeah definitely fatal to humans so uh yeah uh, normally i would like to deploy the parachute at a suitable altitude and plunge into the water, but I have no choice here. And unfortunately, that literally makes the difference between beating 1 hour 10 minutes and coming in slightly behind it. Parachute opens and I have less than a minute to fall this last 500 meters or so. It's just not going to happen. After all that rush, we just sit by and watch it land. One hour, ten minutes and like 15 seconds or thereabouts. I'm going to get better at this, but we'll see that in another episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.